Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. We are in Paradiso of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, we are on number 20, uh, 12 to 22. So I'm going to hand it over to Phil. Phil, floor is all yours. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. So we are continuing on our, on our cosmic journey with Dante and Beatrice, and we are making some progress. Uh, last time we were in the sphere of the sun, and this time around we are, we're done with all the planets. We're going to be looking back from the sphere of Saturn, looking back on our tiny planet Earth, and remark with Dante that what an insignificant place it is compared to the glory of all the, all the heavens. Um, so many things to cover in, 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 in this meetup. I, I'm actually curious which way we're gonna go and what we're going to emphasize. Um, but so many, so many interesting avenues we can, we can uh, digress into. Uh, of course, one of the highlights of, of this for me personally was the meeting between Dante and his great ancestor uh, and uh, I think, uh, um, you know, you, you, I'm sure it, it wasn't lost in you how much time we spent uh, w w with this character that is so important to Dante, his great ancestor, and, and uh, the idea of this uh, family tree, which I think is somewhat lost in us today. We don't really know our roots and don't really care about our roots as much today. Some people do, I guess. Um, especially now with DNA testing, people are trying to figure out where they came from and a little bit of that. But uh, in Dante's day, obviously it was very important. And I, I don't know if you remember uh, in Inferno when we encountered this great uh, person, Farinata, who was another great uh, family, in, uh, head of another great family in, in Florence. The first thing he wanted to know from Dante was, who's your family? Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's something that is, again, uh, really kind of lost on us today. We don't really concentrate on family and family history and accomplishments of the people that uh, have gone before us. But that was definitely something very, very important. And I, I always wonder about Dante's sort of assertions on one side and his actual experience that betrays maybe a little bit of tension between those assertions. I mean, we are in heaven. We're supposed to be thinking about heavenly things. And yet here we are meeting his great ancestor. And all of a sudden, Dante forgets pretty much about Beatrice and uh, all, all this grandeur surrounding him. And he really wants to know uh, about his family history, right? He wants to have a lesson in, in his um, uh, great ancestor's um, pedigree. So that's one, one, definitely one avenue that we, uh, I'm looking forward to discussing uh, uh, today, if you guys uh, wish to do so. However, I, I do want to suggest a couple of things we haven't really done before, and that is uh, taking a particular idea that keeps uh, popping up uh, throughout the commedia, and then trying to trace it up until the current place in our, in our journey. And this idea, uh, which probably will be familiar to you because both uh, Doug and I, we both keep harping on it, but it is really something that keeps uh, being a, a sort of a leitmotif and in, in throughout, the, throughout the work is this idea of uh, wax and seal and this idea of imprinting, of reflecting, of this interplay between nature and will and nature and circumstances. And it just, it, it, it's, it's such a um, interesting concept that I, I thought maybe it's worthwhile to stop and, and, and quickly look back and try to trace the development of this idea and then maybe try to summarize it uh, very quickly. So we, like I said, we haven't really done this. I, I've tried to present grand themes, but not really get, get, it, get to the concrete details of anything. So I'm gonna to try to do something opposite this time and actually uh, maybe you'll look at some of the details and, and you tell me, you know, if it's interesting or not, <laughs> and then, then we can sort of uh, gauge our, gauge our uh, engagement on, um, or interaction uh, based on your feedback. 
uh, in other meetups. Um, so this idea of what, what are we talking about with um, with this idea of uh, seal and wax? Well, uh, let's start let's start from where uh, from where it comes up uh, in a current uh, reading, which is in uh, Paradiso thirteen. Uh, and if if you uh, if you have your um, book available to you, if you open with me to Paradiso thirteen, uh, and I'm doing this with you right now, uh, and verse seventy three. And this is where you know uh, we see we see this idea that that is recently uh, that is the most recent uh, reference to it. And I'll read it in my translation. And it says, uh, "For were the wax appropriately readied, and were the heaven's power at its height, the brightness of the seal would show completely. But nature works defectively. She passes on that light much like an artist who knows his craft." but has a hand that trembles. Yet when the ardent love prepares and stamps the lucid vision of the primal power, a being then acquires complete perfection. So uh, what's the context here? What are we talking about? Well, the discussion is about perfect wisdom and the two perfect men that Dante knows, which are Adam, directly created by God and Christ, also in a way directly created by God through Mary as the vessel. And yet we have the tension there is, we know that Solomon is called the, the wisest man that, have, that has ever lived. So Dante is trying to reconcile these two concepts. He, he's asking um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, I think, uh, at this point, uh, to reconcile these, these seemingly incongruent ideas. And the way Thomas um, reconciles it is he, say, is he uh, says that Solomon was the wisest as far as his kingly duties were concerned. But Christ and Adam had to be the wisest just from the standpoint of their nature and how the, the, this interplay of the, their perfect nature as human beings and the, and the seal of God, and the fact that there was nothing really interfering with the perfection of that image in either one of them to play out. But it's a, such an interesting idea, I thought, uh, especially in this passage where he's, where he's, he's using the simile of an artist who is trying to draw something, make a perfect image, but his hand is trembling. I mean, that is just uh, such an interesting thought to to ponder uh, with this idea that you're trying to imprint something and yet there, there are some imperfections that are inherent in your, in your uh, accomplishment of that. And uh, of course, we, we can trace this idea elsewhere and I'm going to now uh, switch back to some- uh, Before you leave that, before you leave that one spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, just before that, the wax is there to, what are these tri, tri line, three line things? It's back there. The wax is back around 67 also. So we're getting uh, in 60 a description of how um, the rays come down and scatter out and everything's contingent. All, all kinds of things can happen. The seed can grow, the seed cannot grow. All this happenstance, right? So the wax is what's going to be formed by the powers that press and shape it, he says. But the ideal shines through them sometimes more, sometimes less. So, right. yeah, yeah. It's always the flow of the light through things in different ways that refract and reflect them. Right. So that, that's, that's, very, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, David, thank you um, for, for that. Uh, yeah, the idea, this interplay between, and this, you know, this goes back to Plato, right? This idea of uh, platonic forms and how they are incarnated in re in real life, and this idea of um, you have a conception of something perfect, and when that conception is embodied and incarnated in something specific, does it lose that 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 perfection? And Dante, through uh, Thomas, argues that no, there are some instances where that imperfection is not lost, 
it is an, it is full power. And, and like you were saying, there are no contingencies there and, and it shines through perfectly. And yet for us, we, ha we also have that same material, right? Same nature and same image in a sense, the image of God. And yet the, the contingencies and the imperfections are much greater and therefore there's difference of expression and Dante argues also there's difference of emphasis and skill based on other influences on that same wax. And I, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna turn to that next because it's such an interesting concept to kind of pair it with what we just read, which is this idea, and we talked about it last time, I think, um, I got lost my place here. Oh yes, uh, let's turn back to Paradise for Disa eight and verse one twenty seven. And there we're talking about influences of stars, which is of course you know again another theme that goes through this whole journey, right? The influence of stars on people's lives. Astrology was a big deal. It was a big thing on people's minds. How do stars influence life? our lives and what's the relationship of that to our obligations and our free will and our sort of necessity of what, what we must do. And again, Dante makes, makes a very ingenious uh, compromise between the two. And he says that uh, in verse 127, revolving nature, and which of course is referring to the particular sphere that you, that you were born under, whether it's Mars or Jupiter or whatever, uh, a revolving sphere serving as a seal for mortal wax plies well its art, but it does not distinguish one house from another, meaning it does the, the imprint, but it, it doesn't do it uh, based on family ties or anything like that. The question I think there was, how come you have kings that, that are good and yet their sons are evil? And the answer, of course, is that they are born under different, possibly under different influences. And there is no, uh, you know, this is somewhat random in a sense. And therefore you get just, just a distribution of different skills and different attitudes based on the stars. So you do have that imprint on, on, your, mortal, um, on your mortal seal, uh, on your mortal wax rather. Uh, the, the seal in that case is the, the revolving sphere. So we have several, what, uh, what, what, what's starting to emerge from this comparison, just these two passages, is that you have several uh, things that can act as a seal. One, of course, the, the primary one is God himself, right? Acting as this primary seal that is imprinting us with all kinds of things uh, that, that set, set, set us in motion. But the secondary, there are secondary influences, which makes it now, now it's kind of interesting, right? There's an interplay between this primary influence and the secondary, which are the planets, the stars, um, the moving planets, right? Uh, so did that's, get, that's Paradiso 8. Did you read up to 140? Did you read uh, up to line one? Here, uh, let, let's do it, let's, let, let's do it. Um, uh, did you wanna point out something specific there? Yeah, I, I looked down for a second. I missed how far you read because he adds another layer on. He says, I would wrap you one more corollary here. Um, nature, what nature gives, fortune must nourish. So there's nature and nurture. Yep. Right? That's what well, you're saying. Exactly maybe. Like we, <laughs> we argue about today, right? Nature versus nurture. That's, per, that's, that's almost too perfect. Um, then we have, um, and, and, and this is, um, let me try to, right, this, this is uh, going even uh, a little bit further back, and I don't know if you have it, uh, going back to Purgatory for a second, just to compare the development from the two books, from Purgatory or to, to Paradiso, if you do have uh, Purgatory available, uh, whether it's online or in, in a text version, uh, if you turn to Purgatorio 18, there in verses 34 through 39, Dante is talking about not each seal is fine, although the wax is. And there, the, the question that they're discussing is, is any love 
worthwhile, right? And remember, we're, we're talking, you know, this is purgatorio, so we're getting purification from, uh, from loves that are either excessive or misplaced. And so, of course, Dante's argument is, no, not all, not all loves are fine. And the way he explains it is, our, our nature is fine. But what molds and imprints on that nature can be actually something detrimental. And, the, the, and, then, he, and then he talks about how we, we are created in such a way that we tend to seize on anything that we see that excites us. And we seize on it, we start loving it, whether it's something good or bad. Uh, and, and it's part of our nature to do so. Um, okay, so that's, that's that. Uh, just adding another layer to this idea of seal and wax and how they how they interact. And then finally, I want to make one final uh, jump back, and then we're going to go back to back to where we are in, in Paradiso. Um, and that is to to just point out that in Purgatorio 10, where we have this wonderful art gallery of divine art gallery, where we see the carving of Mary. And the way it is described is she, in her stance, there were impressed these words, Eke Angela Dei, which is, this is the handmaiden of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, precisely like a figure stamped in wax. So what he sees is this figure of Mary and the way something, there's something about the way her attitude, her physical, um, position her body the way that her body is presented in that in that marble carving that her very features seem to be imprinted with this idea of submissiveness humility it seems like that imprinting is actually speaking to him these words here is the servant of the lord so again we have this idea of nature as a pliable wax in her case that is able to receive this imprinting from outside. So there's somewhat of a volition, volitional aspect here. It's free will. And uh, of course, um, uh, we end up back in Paradiso with the, the, the wax being completely almost predetermined by God in some ways, like it was with Adam and Christ coming back to Paradiso. Uh, so I think that's that's all I wanted to say about that. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, like that little excursion, a uh, uh, little uh, trip back the memory lane in, in, in a way to trace how this idea is developed uh, throughout, the, throughout the Commedia. And there are some other passages I did not, uh, I had not mentioned, but I thought it was in such an important um, part, of, um, part of Dante's thinking that it, it deserved a, a little extra time. Um, I have other things uh, to add to this, but I'm going to defer now to Doug to uh, to give his um, his uh, thoughts on, on on the reading today. I'm going to try to keep this fairly simple because I um, um, I find the Paradiso more disorienting than the other um, uh, books, partially because. The details, partially uh, because of the sense of movement, partially uh, by I feel that the English translations, uh, I feel like the English translations are more difficult than in Inferno and Purgatorio. I really miss not knowing the Italian, which I mentioned last time. And I think when you get up to the Paradiso, the poetry is so subtle and the resonances are so intimate that the English language in most of the translations just fails to go to the right place. And you have to really absorb it and then sort of see what's really going on under the surface of a, we're further and further from the ideal, I think, that Dante's writing about. So the, the, the stamp that the English language puts on this, I think, you know, you know, confuses the image of what's going on. Uh, and, and I find it kind of exhausting to sort of move beyond that. So I jumped to various translations, but I did want to say the things that strike me, I just want to throw out a few principles quickly, is the movement, which, you know, 
is down into the valley and they keep re repeating this in Paradiso. They go they go up a mountain. He talks often in uh, another sequence, he talks about, I went up the mountain, I went down into the valley and now we're in the world of the spheres. So the world of the spheres has a completely different sense of movement, which is almost instantaneous or is like flying compared to the sort of floating and the kind of muscular clawing and molding and shaping of the other ones. It's more instantaneous. And I compared that to a rushing acting teacher who uses principles of earth, air, water, fire. And so an actor molds shape. How an actor does something is as important as what he does. So an actor can mold something or he can float or he can fly. Different actors do these. But if one actor learns and then the other is radiating, which I didn't fully explain. So I think Paradiso is more flying and radiating and radiating is mysterious. It's like the light that comes from Rembrandt's representation of Christ, the curious girl kind of uh, where, where the subject is the source of light. And, and that's what Michael Chekhov said that an actor could be. By not moving at all, he could influence a room by radiating energy. And that is actually true. There are some actors that can do that. And if you watch the dance theater of Pina Bausch, her dancers are incredible in their ability to convey certain energy. Uh, although I haven't seen them perform recently. So that spiritual state that can radiate, there's a lot of that radiation and flying in this. and. Uh, but there are odd things like the lights and that an emotion reinforces other emotions. So a goodness creates other goodness, creates a light creates more light, a smile creates a bigger smile, that this is communicable. But I don't think the English translation, some are better than others at, at talking about how light and love are like a virus. They infect people and they, 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 they ever, ever make it bigger and greater. And so, it, but it's so conceptualized, it's really hard. I think in the Italian, that's more apparent. And I, I think what little I can sort of grab of the Italian. So also other principles like the movement where he talks about you touch the outside of a bowl and it move, the ripples move inward. You touch the center of the bowl, it moves outward. That's a really important principle throughout this stave where certain energies move from the center of light out in words or sound or music. And then this brightness that gets so bright, they have to like filter it out completely or it's gonna destroy Dante if they actually share, uh, if they actually sing to him once they're up at that one level, it's gonna destroy him. They just make one sound and it makes him fall apart almost. So that sort of thing, it takes me a while to dig these more physical realities out of paradise. They're there, but I and I think it's powerful. Uh, and then the stamp, of course, and a lot of images of birds and the speed of which things happen are, you know, flocks of birds waking up or flying away after they just ate or doing this or doing that or flapping their wings and ready to move. So there's a lot of very high vibration air energy and he uses birds to convey that a lot. Uh, and then the issue of contemplation, which I think leads to this resonance. You know, if you're relaxed, then you drop a stone in the water, it moves, you know. It's like actors who are tense, if another actor says something to them, to them, they can't react spontaneously because they're too stressed, they're too tense. But if they're relaxed, they can really ripple a response back to the other actor. So I find acting principles really important in this. Uh, but I think I'd like to sort of stop it there and see. I, I would share one story when we're back in reading Purgatorio because we talked about na names and bloodlines in this. I have a friend called Marty Casella, Martin Casella, he's a writer. I went to school with him and we reconnected recently. Uh, and I told him about, I passed something on about Casella in the early cantos of Purgatory, who's a friend who rushes up to Dante. And it blew him away because he was in Italy and he mentioned his name and somebody said, oh, like Dante. And he could never figure out what they meant until a decade or two later, I mentioned this character that has his name in the book. So now he's going back and delving deeper into Dante because it answered a riddle that whenever he was in Italy and he'd say his name was Casella, but he'd go, oh, like Dante, and he had no idea what they meant. So I'll end it with that, the, these ripples, you know, so the, somebody planted that to him and then it rippled and he got an answer decades later.
Thanks, Doug. I'm going to actually riff a little bit off of uh, what you said. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about this idea of dancing. Because yeah. as we progress from one heaven to another, there's more and more uh, of motion, circular motion. And it's, but it's not just a motion in a circle, it's actually a heavenly dance. And uh, what's interesting to me, I started looking back again, I like to do these sort of traces through, through the entire Commedia, starting from Inferno all the way to Paradiso as these themes become more and more pronounced. And what happens is there seems to be this progression. Something that is mentioned as positive and jubilant and enjoyable in, Par in Paradiso, the same thing is grotesque and ironic at best, uh, sometimes sarcastic uh, in Inferno. So the uh, dance is actually dancing is actually mentioned in Inferno, but it is mentioned as a as a mockery, as a uh, essentially as a taunt to sinners who are stuck in a similar uh, circular motion. And this is um, if you go back, uh, you don't have to do this now. Turn there now, but if you are interested. Inferno 7 is where we have the, uh, the squanderers. And if you, if you remember, they also move in a circle. And, but their, their motion is not jubilant or enjoyable. They are, act, it's vain. It's a vain, mo uh, empty motion that doesn't do anything. They're not progressing anywhere. They're not enjoying it. They just meet and they uh, beat their breasts and they say, why do you squander? Uh, why do you hoard? And that's their dance. And the word is uh, there is also used uh, is the same word for dancing that's used elsewhere in Paradiso and in um, other places. Uh, also, another mock mocking type of dance is the souls that are stuck under the 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 pitch, the 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 uh, the fraudsters that uh, the the ones that used bribery, and the demons of course are trying to catch them as they come out. You know, emerge from the pitch, and that this also is a dance, but not the kind of dance that you want to be part of. Uh, however, as we move up and we get to the earthly paradise in Purgatorio, we see the first positive mention of dancing, and that, of course, is uh, the dance of the four and three ladies. The four ladies signifying the four cardinal virtues, and the three ladies signifying the Christian virtues, and they are involved in this beautiful dance. And Dante describes it at length, how they're moving uh, in, 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 a, in this very, in a, uh, I was thinking of the, um, what's that painting, uh, Primavera, um, the, by, um, uh, what, I'm, I'm going blank, but somebody help me out. Uh, anyway, Italian. Botticelli. Yes, thank you, thank you, Botticelli, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I, I have these uh, uh, blanks. Yes, thank you. So I was thinking of Botticelli, you know, that famous dance of the, uh, uh, the, the beautiful dance that he has there. So, and then of course we get to Paradiso and everything is a dance. All these souls, they move, they are like shining. The picture is they're shining like gems of different, different types of gems, rubies or sapphires or pearls. And they're moving in, in these concentric circles. And Dante is essentially in, uh, moving from circle to circle as he talks to different ones. And he's also, I guess, in this wheeling motion as he is interrogating them. But they're not in a hurry. It's a, not a dance of, but it is a, an orderly, it's not just a chaotic bouncing. It's actually an orderly dance. And, and, they, and the, at some point, I think they use the word misura, which is, I guess, the, the word for measure. So the dance is very measured. It's, it's a very um, a, a sort of a pointed thing, very uh, um, structured thing is what I was trying to say. Um, and at one point, Dante talks about the 15 brightest stars of heaven, plus the seven stars of the little, uh, uh, is it the little dipper or the big dipper? Uh, the big dipper, sorry. And, and the two stars of the little dipper uh, forming together 24 stars, 12 and 12. And he asked us to imagine these 12 stars forming two concentric circles. And that is something that what, what, he, what he's seeing. And this is in uh, Paradiso uh, 13 also. The double dance, that's, that's the expression he uses, the double dance. 
Um, so speaking of motion and how the different, uh, uh, again, just uh, you know what Doug was talking about, the difference in motion going down Inferno, climbing up in Purgatorio, and here we are swirling up and kind of just going up with, with this instantaneous speed, but also uh, not just uh, not just going up, but actually sort of going in a in a in this swirling circle of of, of dancing and participating in this dance that's celebrating uh, different different aspects of, of 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 God's goodness or attributes or whatever. So that's uh, something that I also wanted to point out. Uh, yeah, that go ahead. There seems to also be in the spheres a kind of expanding and contracting, the rippling in and out and rings within rings. And then the vibrating of the lights, which struck me. I realized I was shocked. I meant to mention this. I was shocked by the fact that he anticipated throbbing disco lighting that echoes the music and the words of a song. He actually has a scene where the angels really sing aggressively. And he said the lights sort of reinforce the words. <laughs> and so I go, oh my gosh, how did he anticipate uh, disco well, lighting let, effect. Yeah, th and let's not forget, of course, this concept of the music of the spheres, which is also Dante picks up on, and uh, there's music that uh, is different in each sphere. And of course, uh, uh, astrologically, I think each planet was associated with a different note, uh, I believe, or, or maybe a different chord. Um, so that also, this whole idea of melodies, different melodies, associated with different spheres is, is quite interesting. Of course, the character of each planet would determine the types of notes you would play. As for instance, you have Sun, which is regal and kingly, and you, then you have Mars, which is more military uh, um, uh, force, and then uh, Mercury maybe more daintily uh, flying, or, you know, more flighty and, and so forth. Um, so that's, that's another interesting concept. All right, at this point, I want to open it to anyone who wishes to contribute their thoughts on, on the reading. Uh, maybe just uh, put an exclamation point in, um, in the chat or raise your hand and we will let, let, uh, we'll call on you and that way we can do this in a sort of a structured way. Uh, Allison, you're first. Yeah, just put an exclamation point if you wish to contribute. Um, one thing that I was, when I was, <clears throat> or my throat, I was reading the um, the section with the, the two circles, inter, um, one inside the other, and I kept thinking about how you have that in many of the classical ballets. So I went back and um, I actually went back and looked at clips from each one. And what I found was really interesting was that um, in both Giselle and Swan Lake, it's one circle when something really bad is happening. Like in Giselle, they're trying to dance Albert to death. Um, but in the Nutcracker, you have the two circles. And what was so interesting, and I have no idea if, um, it was choreographed by Marius Petipa, and I have no idea if he was influenced by Dante or not, but he does, it. it's the, um, the dance of the snowflakes. So it's a really interesting part in Nutcracker because it represents the shift from Clara being a little girl to Clara being a mature woman. And so as she goes to the land of the sweets, that's when she becomes a woman and she's mature, but it marks the transition between the two worlds. And I thought that's really interesting because when you have the two circles here, it's really representing how Dante is maturing as, as, a, as a man. He's not just like the carefree young man um, in the first two um, sections. He's really like a mature adult man here. And here come the two circles. So I thought that was just kind of an interesting little connection there. Oh, sorry, Joe, Joe go ahead. I'm, I'm cut you. Oh, okay, oh, no uh, problem at all. Yeah, if, and again, if any, anybody else wants to contribute, just put an exclamation point in the chat. No, I mean, I the thing that I found to be the most interesting in these, um, Cantos was the obviously his interaction with his great great grandfather, and um, primarily because of uh, you get a feeling for what the relationship was for a person in their city, and what it was actually there. It's it's the it's their actual self, 
so that's how they identify themselves. So you kind of understand what the importance was of him being not allowed to go back uh, to, to Florence. So, and they actually spoke about obviously the downfall and where Florence is and what, and you know, what it's like now, but it also had this like nostalgic bend of Florence at one point, which was kind of odd because it was still always corrupt and they were still going to war. And he was a war uh, um, hero. Uh, he was killed in the second crusade, I think, was it? Um, so, I mean, the, this, this, and it's an, it's an interesting thing because there's this element of, well, it's, it's interesting one fact that he's related to Dante and if he's somebody that actually is kind of outside the norm in that regard, uh, you know, he's just kind of a normal person to, even though he's well known. Um, but the other thing is there's a sense of pride that Dante still has when he's interacting with him. And that's actually, uh, after all he's gone through, I've kind of thought that to be kind of interesting that he would still allow himself to say, you know, feel this this pride as knowing that after he's gone through purgatory and hell. Um, and then the other aspect of it though, is that there is an element of courage uh, that you kind of see that his, his great grandfather gives him in the sense of actually writing the poem and that his poems always going to be remembered. So I think that that's, uh, that was interesting to see these kind of this, this virtue and vice kind of interplay and then this there's relationship of self in the city itself uh how you're you're identifying not only with your family and your pride but also the city and what that really meant uh at, at that particular moment in time so that was the, that was the most interesting i mean there's obviously some other things that we can go into uh, especially with cantos 19 and 20 but uh, i'll leave it there for now did you, I'm curious, uh, and I'm throwing this out to anyone, uh, but also to you, Joe, since you brought it up. Uh, did you sympathize with that um, sort of good old times no. nostalgia? You did not. Well, no, it was, it was uh -huh. very, it was very, it was kind of um, elitist. <laughs> uh, and that's it to me. It's, uh, yeah, that's the feeling that I got to it. Okay. Okay. No, I, I, I'm very interested because. As I get older, I, I can sympathize a little more and more, I feel like. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, I, but I also know that it's probably a psychological thing. And we tend to idealize our past. And we tend to always look back on the, the past. We pick out good things about it. And, we, and of course, the, the, the longer in the past you go, the more chances to idealize you have. Because first of all, you weren't even there. Uh, Right. And second, you can pick and choose the things that you like and really ignore things you don't like. Uh, but actually, uh, you know, we talked about medieval mindset and how it's different from modern mindset. And I think it's really a, a feature of modern, I would say, progressive mindset that we started looking at future as being better than the past. But before, most people looked at, back to some sort of golden age. And this is, you know, this is true of Ovid in Metamorphoses, right? He writes about the golden age. I mean, he's writing 2,000 years ago. And to him, things are really bad right now. But, but guess what? Another 2,000 years back, things were really stellar. Uh, so uh, it's just an interesting thing to trace how people in the, in the Middle Ages really look back to Greece and to other er uh, and even to their maybe more recent history as ideal as golden age as something to be uh, aspired to but they didn't really think about future as a progression towards something better which is something we do today hopefully uh, uh, maybe maybe we're becoming more medieval though because uh <laughs> the people are not less less optimistic than they were let's say in the 70s and, and the 60s uh than they are today surprisingly i think it's interesting that's an interesting way of looking at it because i always one of the things that I think about, um, one of the sayings that I always uh, uh, repeat to people is like, the good old days weren't always good and tomorrow's never as bad as it seems. And, but, you know, when I'm trying to talk to somebody, but I, it, it's, there is something that I, I think we do tend to idealize the past. 
I, I, no matter where we are in our lives, I think we'd say, oh, you know, that was so great. Uh, it was, it was so much better back then. Um, just because I, 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 I'm not sure why psychologically we do it, but I do think it's something that we tend to do. And I, and I, you can see it pretty clearly with this, in this particular instance. Yeah. Um, okay. And even as, because they were at war too. So, I mean, they were, it was, you know, the crusades. So it was hardly a time that we you would want to idealize anyway that's all right, all right. so thanks no problem. um uh mr pullman i'm sorry i don't know your first name uh steve 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 please, go yeah ahead. yeah i've been trying to change that but i can't okay. <laughs> um does um dante address the effects of ancestors on your personality that Okay, um, so questions, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll try to answer for now, but we'll, we'll do questions later, but um, uh, I believe he does. I believe he does early in, in actually in Paradiso, which he talks about, uh, again, the interplay of, of seal and wax in, in, in this particular uh, context, meaning uh, you have, you, you inherit something from your father, but then there are also other influences that are from these spheres, and they mix it up a little bit, that which... Uh, if, if that did not happen, everybody would be like their father, because I think they believe that the father's seed was the determining factor in everybody's sort of outlook. Uh, the, the female just really contributed the womb, but didn't really influence the, the, the children's personalities or, or skills so much. So yes, I do believe he does address it. Okay, but it's just the father. It's not ancient ancestors at all. He doesn't address that. Um, yeah, that's... A, that one I don't know. Let's 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 uh, table that for now. Maybe we can we can pick this up uh, when we do the we're going to have a Q and A session after after everybody shares their their sort of uh, impressions. But thank you. That's an interesting that's an interesting question. Uh, so we'll we'll definitely table that for now. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, let's see, David. Yeah, I I like what. Uh, I believe Joe is bringing up about uh, the connection to land and your family and these relations and their historical growth and how much do they have permanence, these mundane things, and how much are they sort of transient? And he's, he's so embedded, even all the way at this high spiritual level with the view of earthly struggles, you know, between land masses and between finally between you know the church and the way they're treating people, which are, which are questions of you know what's happening on the earth, but then he goes to the, this higher level and he's looking down at the earth as just a speck, where there you know it's like remember the view of the earth as a blue marble. There's no boundaries. There's nothing, and it's only this dust at this instant. So he sort of gets elevated beyond all these physical limitations and boundaries of self-definition, which are, you have to impose those kind of limits on your own self-view. And remember when he started talking to his ancestor and was making such a big deal out of the bloodline, that's when Beatrice, Beatrice gives him this look askance, like, are you really doing that in heaven now you're doing that? So it's not the appropriate tie. We are bound to our past, but we're free of it, I think, in this paradigm, right? Because people can do amazing things. Look at, you know, the, the history of, of uh, uh, Francisco, you know, uh, what he did with his family to break away and become a pauper and become so holy. So. That's good. That's good, Dave. Thank you. Uh, yeah, also, I, I, I'm a little ambivalent. I, I don't know that I fully trust. Um, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that you know Dante. He has he has already been immersed into two rivers, Letho and you knowing, and he's supposedly now purified, so that his desires themselves are supposed to be pure now. And yet, like people have mentioned, they are not totally pure. <laughs> They're still earthly, and this idea of really getting purified from earthly things. I am not fully convinced that that actually ever happens for him. Well, are you making a distinction between the desires which are passions and the desire for the knowledge of things, which is 
maybe that's different. His reasoning, he's still working on his reasoning, even though his heart is purified, he has no ill intention, but he's still reasoning out like his relationships. So it's, it's at the higher level, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I take your point. Uh, anyone else, anyone else wants to, wants to share? Just type in an exclamation point in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to point out that um, I think I'm trying to find this exact passage, but anyway, where he talks about, um, you know, why do we why do we put so much weight on on families, um, you know, the glory of our name and things like that? You know, he he says it, and then he says, uh, okay, despite that, uh, I was still I was still happy to <laughs> to have seen my ancestors there, so. I feel like, you know, like Shakespeare, the lady doth protest too much. I feel like he's not quite, quite there yet. <laughs> but that's my opinion. I mean, you, you guys are free. To... <laughs> I would be curious to see what other people think about that. I also want to point out, and I'm curious what everyone else thought about this. You, uh, I'm sure you noticed that he compares um, Kachiguida to the meeting, or to meeting Kachiguida, to meeting between uh, Anchises and um, Aeneas in the Aeneid. And of course, that's a, that's a seminal comparison, right? Uh, you know, Virgil was our guide up, up until the end of Purgatorio. And so now we're back with a, in a big way to, to, to uh, recollect our connection to Virgil and, 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 and this idea that this journey into the underworld and now uh, upper worlds is, is in, in a lot of ways still reminiscent and parallels uh, Virgil's description in Aeneas chapter six of um, Aeneas' journey to, to see the um, Elysium. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that they wanna share uh, or anything else for that matter, uh, anything that we've read up to this point, uh, please put in um, exclamation point and we'll call on you. I'll give a couple of minutes. Uh, Doug, do you want to share anything else in the meantime? Not right now. I, I think there's a lot that's thrown out on the table. And I, yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I mean, we have lots and lots of threads. Uh, uh, Isabel, do you want to share anything with us that, uh, from your vast store of? Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from Isabel. I'd That's right. Yeah, we definitely would well, love just, to hear. Just, uh, just a little bit back to the dance because I keep on. Uh, not saying the right thing in these uh, little chats. But anyway, uh, back to the dance. Don't forget the very beautiful dance in hell, uh, the upper hell, let's say, uh, with the sodomists, where they are in a circle, very similar to Matisse, very, very similar. And I corrected myself by saying uh, sodomists and not homosexuals. The homosexuals, you will see another dance very similar, Philip, to the one you mentioned between the avaricious and the prodigals where they go round, mm -hmm. clank, 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 more like a clock, I would say, is up mm -hmm. in upper purgatory in the final uh, uh, circle mm -hmm. of, of fire where you have the same-sex lovers clank with the um, hetero lover heterosexuals, clank, clank. And they're not allowed to meet. They have to just, oh, no, excuse me, they kiss. They don't clank. They, 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 but it's the same movement, like a clock. Heterosexual, homosexual, hetero. And it's quite surprising, I think, for many of us to see that so high up, close to the, uh, the earthly paradise. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I'll have to check that one out. I, I, I must have missed that when I was doing my search for dancing. <laughs> oh, quite. Uh, well, if you got the um, the wastrels and, and you saw that as a dance, yes. I, I saw that as a TikTok because TikTok. of the clanging. Yeah. Remember, there was a big bang when they when they right, play. right, when they meet. Yeah, that, I, don't, I don't see that as a dance. But that same movement, but the movement of the homosexuals, the, excuse me, the sodomists is a dance. It's a circular Beautiful, yes. actually. Yes. Yeah. Which canto is that in, Isabel? Uh, the the, homo the uh, sodomist in the yes. canto of the sodomy uh, with uh, Brunetto Latini. Brunetto Latini canto. Oh, yes. Back in the, uh, the book. Back yeah. in the, the burning sand. Very mm -hmm. dance-like, yeah. Yeah. 
And even the way they kind of passed each other on the road, that had a kind of dance movement or, uh, um, you know, in that other sphere or that other, um, <laughs> words are failing me today, but they, they moved up the platforms. They, they, there were people coming back and forth. And of passers. course, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt that. Um, of course, we, uh, uh, we need to qualify what we see in, in, um, in Paradiso 18 in the sphere of Jupiter, where the angels are forming letters. We must qualify that as a dance. <laughs> and I'm not, I remember if it, it actually, uh, he calls it explicitly a dance, but that's what they're doing. They're actually dancing and whirling and forming letters as they do so. Uh, just like uh, what's that like flash mob like a flash mob <laughs> that's what they're doing that's the first flash mob <laughs> that we see in heaven the, the flying lights right the flying lights i think uh ruby like uh he he calls it yeah yeah ruby right uh and they form these letters which form uh the beginning of uh, one of the apocryphal books uh book of wisdom which says uh ye the judge the earth love justice, uh, diligiti justitium, uh, I forget my Latin, um, qui utica terum, something like that. Um, let's see, do we have anyone else who wants to, who wants to share? Uh, I'll give a couple more minutes and then we will go to to our breakout rooms and you can you know just talk about anything that caught your attention in a small group and then uh, if you have a uh, a best question that emerges from that uh, keep track of that and we'll we'll record uh, we will uh, address that in our Q&A session after the breakout rooms so just I'll give a couple more minutes if anyone else wants to uh, share something with the entire group and then we will we will do the um, we'll do the breakout rooms. Uh, Madeline, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I did notice um, in the discussion of <clears throat> whether or not uh, people who uh, were born before Christ or um, were born in another culture and were never exposed to Christ, do they go to heaven? He took that opportunity to once again get revenge on people who he doesn't like. Long, long lists of people who are supposedly Christian but are not going to heaven, even though they espouse Christianity. And I, I just thought, wow, he, you know, he, he weaves so much in here with the theology and the personal things and the things about um, his lineage and uh, also his use of, uh, once again, those kind of um, verbs that didn't really exist in Italian and don't really exist in English either, that he went ahead and, and just kind of made up and used anyway, that um, like um, your life in futures itself, far beyond the punishings of their treacheries, um, there was, um, something about the truth that, that so enwombs me. Um, it was just, it, once again, I was really struck by the language and the effort that uh, my translators, who were Derling and Martinez, uh, the effort that they made to convey the kind of neologisms that he was working with. And I don't know how that came across in other people's translations. Uh, could, could you repeat that last one? I didn't quite uh, catch that. Oh, um, I don't know how that came across in other people's translations. Um, I have, I had marked a few places. Um, except, of course, now I can't find them. Um, <laughs> where he did this. Um, oh, and also the the. Um, the kind of volitional quality of inanimate objects. Um, he, he mentions, um, he's talking about he's going to move on soon. Um, 
the difficult past that draws me to itself. <clears throat> and I see that even in, uh, sometimes I see that in language and news stories, um, like um, the fire was chasing us and it was, it was trying to get us. So this, um, <clears throat> both the, the neologisms of taking things into himself from the world, whether he's in future or in wound or God is dis one O-N-E-D, um, and the volitional qualities of what we regard as inanimate objects, uh, somehow those fit together, uh, but I'm not sure how. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Isabel, did you want to add something to that? Excuse me, no, I'm sorry, not to that, but it was something that I wanted to pick up on the very first passage that you read. But before that, I just want to tell you that, just to give an intro to what I would like to read, is that um, I um, I watch very carefully everything on YouTube or that is about Dante, everything. And now there's so much with the 20, uh, with this anniversary. And I've been watching Dante D from Georgetown University where they have these experts come and, and talk. I don't know if any of you saw that. But anyway, one expert uh, was so enamored of the idea of trying to see a Muslim presence in Dante, a kindly, a good Muslim presence that he actually distorted his uh, reading of, of, the, of Limbo, whereby he says that the man with the sword is the Saladino. And I, of course, do, do, do immediately wrote, no, the man with the sword is Homer. And, and then he did not, he should have clarified in the, in the, in the YouTube recorded, but he didn't, but he did clarify in the chat. And he said that he wanted, as I said, he, he was looking so much for that point that he wanted to do it. Another, in another, another expert had said also that Beatrice introduces Dante uh, to the Virgin. No, Beatrice does not introduce Dante to the Virgin. Uh, it is Saint Bernard, but she wanted so much to show the presence of the power of women. See, so we have to be so careful. And these are experts. Now, if you would kindly turn to Canto 13, when you were reading, I'm going to read uh, 112 and how important this is for us, giving this, these two examples. And by the way, anybody who writes a thesis is tempted to do that. You know, you got to back up your thesis so you keep on. Well, anyway, and let this way a lead to slow your steps to make you move as would a weary man to yes or no, when you do not see clearly whether he would affirm or would deny. He who decides without distinguishing must be among the most obtuse of men. Opinion, hasty, often can incline to the wrong side. And then affection for one's own opinion binds, confines the mind. And that's what happens. So you have to be so careful when you have an idea, you have a point, and then you mold the text to make it, uh, uh, to mold it to your idea. So careful you have to be. Thank you. Yes, confirmation bias for sure. Uh, <laughs> we all do it, uh, but thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that was actually a great passage there. I mean, 13 was maybe my favorite uh, canto of the ones we read because it is so full of, 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 first of all, that whole uh, passage on, you know, the wax and the seal. But the other, other interesting uh, was a list of medieval conundrums that Dante uses to sort of illustrate how many things are unknown to us and uh, the limits of our understanding. And of course, a lot of these were sort of like scholastic questions that we really don't think about anymore, like how many angels are there? And he didn't mention how many angels can sit on a, on a uh, pin of a needle. <laughs> but some, some of those questions were quite, quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, okay, we're gonna go to the breakout rooms now. Um, and um, like I mentioned, if you have an interesting question that emerges from that, uh, bring it back to us and we will uh, we will uh, try to answer it together as a group uh, and be, uh, just let everyone have a chance to talk and enjoy. So we're, we're going to go to the breakout rooms and let's go ahead and do it. Madeline has her hand up, uh, I think. 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, um, <clears throat> following on to what Isabel just said, it is one of the things I've been enjoying so much about this group is that uh, we're looking at Dante and knowing that we're doing it through modern eyes, but um, we're looking at it and saying like, what is this thing? Like what, what type of thing is this that we have in front of us? Instead of trying to make it conform to uh, something that we would like it to be or to modernize it in some way. And I just want to say it's, it's really, it's been a fantastic experience all the way through because of that, among other reasons. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to assign people to the room. Uh, give me just one second and we will uh, one assigned. All right, here we go. So, it's time for the lightning round. What's your question? What's the best question you have for either on this part of Paradiso or on Dante in general? I'm going to keep track of all the questions. I'm going to organize them and then we're going to go do a lightning round on all of them. So if you'd yeah, like to have, ask. Uh, uh, we had a very interesting question come up in our group Mm -hmm. which has to do with um, the difference between uh, Southern Europe and Northern Europe in their treatment of uh, ancestry and the effect of ancestry, ancestors on, on their personal life. Wow. Uh, this was an interesting question. If anybody knows the answer to that or wants to talk about that, that would be great. I think that's a fascinating question. Wonderful. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Just go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. It's a small group of people. So if you want, you can just unmute and ask your question. That's fine too. David was gonna ask one on free will or, or I can ask it or whatever. David, would you like Joe yeah. to ask your question or would you like to ask your question yourself? I, it was sort of an observation. So if Joe can frame it as a question, I would appreciate it. All right, Joe, uh, do your magic. Um, no, it, it was, it's the, uh, or was it? It was the idea of God's, the idea of God's plan and his infinite wisdom uh, and how people just accept that. And how do you reconcile that with free will? Okay, acceptance of God's plan. It's kind of a straightforward answer, I know, but there, it kind of framed, the way it was an interesting observation is it framed the way Kant actually had written. Okay. Uh, had different. Very good. Uh, Allison. Um, yeah, we, our question was more about how, and it's more for people who haven't read this yet, but how, how do you think this is going to end in the next set of cantos and how, like what ending would feel the most satisfying? Oh. Like we figure it's going to have this happy ending, but would it make more sense for, um, for Dante to screw up and wind it back in hell. <laughs> okay, how is it going to? Are, are you doing the version, alternate ending version of Dante? <laughs> yes, uh, but basically. <laughs> okay. Like, we're like, okay, he's going to keep floating around, everything's happy, but you know, or it could be like Jaws, where like the shark comes back at the end. So <laughs> Dante, <laughs> something horrible happens and Dante's right back down in the inferno. Okay, all right. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Okay, so we can go from go from what we have, and then sure, uh, I, have, I do have one more. So go ahead. Uh, th there was a question about Dante's attitude towards other faiths, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether it's heretics or other non-Christian faiths. Mm -hmm. so I thought that was an interesting question. Maybe we, somebody can talk about that. Other faiths, wonderful. All right, so let's take Allison's question. It's really fascinating. Um, how does it all end? How do you think you should all uh, it should end? Any any thoughts about about this? I've never asked such a question about a work like this. Anybody? What would be a fitting ending to to this? We brought this question up because um, 
for people who have not read the entire Paradiso, um, we were saying that there was so many, so many descriptive, uh, uh, bizarre descriptive events in Purgatory, and Paradiso is this stunningly, uh, um, yeah, like Afro, not aphrodisiac, but celestial events. So in the last third will it be even more celestial like events um you know what what could possibly be the outcome thank you thank you beatrice uh, next up is going to be madeline david and joe madeline uh, i think we have a clue in canto 17 line 112 down through the endlessly bitter world and along the mountain from whose lovely summit the eyes of my lady have raised me. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is David. Right. I don't think I, I caught that, if that's a foreshadowing uh, of the end. But um, I, after flying so high, I expect to see him collapse on the ground. But I'd like him to wake and really feel alive and kind of energized, exalted in, in something about how he's going to live now, you know, and really just hear about that feeling on the ground. Now I can really be here the right way, something like that, and really eat a roast beef sandwich the way I'm supposed to and shake a hand and do all the, you know, mundane while I've got that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Joe followed by Doug. Joe. This is, this is going to sound absolutely terrible is what I'm about to say, but I'd like to see him go back and like just fall flat on his face and go back to being arrogant. Like after all this, you know, and, and, and see him, like did him not learn the lessons of all the things that he did and, and and that it would be interesting if he if that were the ending that he went back and nothing had changed him at all through all this anyway it's, a, it's brilliant how could he not in yeah fact? seriously doug well, i had i had two thoughts uh one is sort of what some people have touched on that there is an essay about Christmas Carol called The Two Scrooges by a great scholar, uh, Wilson, I think it was, or, uh, and he sort of says the next day after he is nice to everybody, Scrooge is going to wake up and be the same horrible businessman he was, that it was sort of a schizophrenic break and he's not going to remember anything, he's just going to go back to the habits of who he was. I don't necessarily agree with that because I, I do think there are some changes like that that really last and some that don't, you know, but that's one reaction, which is interesting because the mystical journey and Christmas Carol is oddly similar to this, you know, and the three structures of past, present and future, which seems to be based on mesmeric thinking. It took me decades to realize Dickens was patterning off of mesmerism, but then, uh, because he did practice mesmerism, but I learned that very recently. Uh, the other is that I think there's a sort of, it really is a movement through obstacles to the center of love. And I think that's really what the book is about. And it's very, the many traditions, whether they're Jewish, Islamic, or Christian that live side by side in Spain for four or 500 years, I think that's where he's moving towards. And he's sort of Christianizing it, but it really is that it's to the, it's the journey through obstacles to the center of love. And that's the same in almost all traditions of the West anyway, Jewish, Islamic, and uh, Christian. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next up is Isabel followed by Phil. Isabel. Yes, thank you. Um, I can't uh, see, uh, see Dante as arrogant, and I cannot see a, an ending different from the one which he has given. I think it is the most, the only ending that it could have. Uh, he could not possibly, he, he was arrogant and he did all kinds of, uh, through his life, we all are, we, we make terrible mistakes, um, but, anyone who writes 
the way he writes and has the insights and the artistry and the inspiration that he has cannot have a small spirit. Piccolo cannot be, cannot be. That's it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I also had the same kind of feeling. It's kind of like music, right? You have Beethoven's symphony, you know, the whole thing has been built up and it's kind of coming to the end. Okay, now the thing is that the whole thing, the entire sequence and has been calculated very carefully to land a particular way. So I don't think alternative endings work, you know, work like this because it is such a great integration of things. So I, you know, so I, I, I do think I agree, agree with uh, Isabel. I mean, it's the question kind of jars my mind a little bit, given that I'm very big fan of music. Uh, and in large compositions, that's I mean, that's the um, feeling I have. Uh, Phil. Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, this is great. I, I love your interlude there with the music because I was going to say exactly uh, something along those lines. And Isabel also mirrored what, what, what I was going to say. Um, that in medieval, you know, I keep coming back to this medieval mindset. And I, there's a logic to that mindset, which is if you build something on the left, you have to build something on the right. You can't just decide all of a sudden to go whiz in another direction because that's not how cathedrals are built. That's not how symphonies are, are written, at least in that time. However, once you get into the modern period, when we become cynical and dystopian and things don't go just along the trajectory that you have set up in chapter one, <laughs> Yes, you could have an alternative ending, but not in that period and not at that time. Uh, also about this notion that of the two Scrooges and the notion of your nature, I actually think that Dante did not change. He regained what he had originally and, and what he had lost. Maybe as a child, as a young man, he had that vision of love and some version of the vision of God in that. And he lost that as he started pursuing lesser loves, as he would call them, right? And now he's regaining all of it. And it's his redemption. That's the story of it all. It's, it's the, that's the logic of it all. So I would agree with Isabel and the less cynical of you <laughs> that, that in fact, yes, it could not have ended any other way because of the trajectory and the logic of who he is now. Thank you, Phil. Next up is Alison, followed by Maxine. Alison. Hey, don't give it away, if, please. <laughs> um, now, what I was, we were talking about is that it used to be that American movies were always known for having happy endings, whereas European movies were always known for having these darker endings. And that, you know, people attributed that to that the two world wars were fought on their territory, territory not so much, you know, not really ours, except for Pearl Harbor. Um, but I was thinking that the last year and a half has made America a much, much, much more dark, cynical kind of place that now, you know, like it, it feels like that's what should happen because we're, we've gotten so used to this, but I don't really want, I want the happy ending. I always do, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Next up is Maxine. A lot of times when you get to the end of a musical work, a large musical work, you'll come to a repeat sign and it will send you back to the beginning and then tack on a coda, which is a little tag on the end. Well, perhaps um, what Joe said, uh, he would slip and fall back down again to the beginning, but this time he would know how to get back up again. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maxine. All right, uh, that, that was a fascinating question. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say, I mean, apart from the, the point that Alison made about, you know, kind of happy versus sad uh, kind of valuing, there is also an epistemological issue here. The mind that Dante has is very different from the modern mind. The modern mind is very subjectivist. You know, people say, oh, do what you feel like. 
Okay, and that is considered to be okay. That's not Dante's mind. And that's not the mind of that time. You know, everything is planned. Everything is thought out. Everything is integrated. Everything is brought together. You know, what he's done in his work of bringing in history and philosophy and art and everything that he knew into this one thing, that's a very different kind of a mindset. It's an integrative mindset. Um, So I think there is a difference in that. Um, Next up is Doug. I just wanted to briefly comment what Phil said. I think uh, even in Scrooge, he's retrieving something he lost. When his little sister dies, it really tears him apart. It's clear that creates a disruption. So Scrooge at the end is really returning to an inevitable return to the feminine and things he learned from his sister who actually kind of saves his life and pulls him out of the school uh, when she's a young child. So it's a, it's a recovery, I think, in both cases. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, David. David, you're on mute. There you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, it just it also occurred to me that the ending has to, and this is kind of what everyone was just summing up, the ending has to make sense of having made this journey, what it means to have carried all of this and be walking around on earth with this complete vision. So it has to be something amazing, like to concretize what is entirely off the, the planet that we live in. So just what does that mean? Dying to know. <laughs> You'll find out soon. Wonderful, Phil. I just want to uh, quickly add maybe one thing that I would love to see in terms of an alternative is maybe Dante praying Virgil out of limbo into paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, next up is Judy. Um, I wanted to find out if what he what did he really do after he finished. The Divine Comedy. Did he write another book? I mean, what did he do? Oh, that's a great question. Anybody has yeah. answer? What did Dante do after this? They say that the end of a book, the, the, the last chapter or the last um, chapter of, of the book is the beginning of the next book. So that's a lot of people I've, have heard say that about in, in writing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I was just wondering, if he, what did he do? Did he have an existential crisis or ask what am I I gonna do now or what? I think he continued working. Remember he was in exile. Mm -hmm. So he had to work for his living. And I think the the Paradiso was written very close to his uh, death. Uh, The the Commedia took an awful long time to write. Mm -hmm. To me, it's it's, uh, amazing how he could do that without a computer, without little index cards and remembering all the characters and not really making mistakes, a couple of mistakes here and there. But um, no, I think he continued and he was in a mission actually uh, when he died, he he developed uh, pneumonia or uh, what was it? No, malaria, I think. So he continued to work. Um, I know he also wrote La Questione de Acqua Terra. It's a philosophical work about get this, what is the level of the element of earth and the water? Is the element of earth uh, a little bit lower than the element of water when they are at rest? Or is the element of water a little bit lower? That he was working on that, it's a physics problem. Oh, so, oh. but I don't know if he was working on that, uh, on that then, but apart from his eclogues and his uh, letters and his his divine comedies his, and his convivio, the, uh, his uh, vulgar eloquencia, the monarchy, and all all this stuff he did. Um, I think he was pretty close to death at the end of I Paradiso. See. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Doug. Yes, that's uh, my hit. But also, I think he kept in his early life writing books and then kind of not quite finishing them. And when he tackled the bigger subject, then he quit that to tackle a bigger subject. And the big subject was the Divine Comedy. And once he finished that, it seemed to be his life work. And, uh, and my hit is, is Wonderful. That he passed away soon after. Thank you. Um, uh, Isabel, can I ask you a question? Oh, wait a minute. Before that, uh, Michael, and then I'm going to ask uh, Isabel a question. Uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, well, the, the the Divine Comedy was completely published in 1320, and, and Dante dies in 1321. So yeah. 
there were a few other there were a few other minor works. One of which, the uh, one on water that uh, was just mentioned. And he also wrote he also wrote some poems, uh, uh, published in a volume called Eclogues that were kind of uh, mm-hmm. Virgilian uh, in, in tone and form. But essentially, you know, after this, he only had a year or so to live. So wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, Isabel, uh, can you tell us about your experience of reading uh, Dante? You know, when, when did you start? What was your reaction? How have you read him over the years? Um, he, uh, very bad. I had a very bad experience with Dante. I was telling the small group. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to write a paper on him. And I think it was only, uh, I, I chose to, wrote, to write uh, my master's thesis on it. That was uh, 80 pages. I said, how can I do that? I can't even write two pages. And I hated it. I had just come from Petrarca. I had fallen in love with Petrarca. Nothing could have been better than Petrarca mm-hmm. until I read Dante. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then Petrarca disappeared. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, at the beginning, no, I could not. I found him uh, uh, silly. I found it obscure. I found it um, boring. I found it difficult to read. I didn't like his similes. I was, as I was saying, he was sort of talking about little flowers, the, poking their little beautiful little pale into the sun. That's who was he? That's stupid. <laughs> and and uh, so so I went from that to not when I finished my my when I was finishing my my thesis, I couldn't stop writing. I couldn't stop. I went to 110 pages and I couldn't, I could have written 110 more. <laughs> so there was a big transformation for me. But if I can just go back to what somebody was saying about he tried this and he didn't finish and he tried them and he didn't finish the convivio and he didn't finish and all that. Well, of course he didn't finish. I, I don't know, maybe um, uh, David knows that Heidegger also started his book and it was gonna be great. It was gonna be big. Mm, he's in the wrong direction. That's not what he wanted to say. That's exactly what Dante, Dante no, he didn't want to write this heavy book the, about uh, philosophy and, 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 and morals and this and that. He wanted to write books, a, a book for you, you, not, not for this elite. That's, first of all, he didn't write it in Italian, in Latin. Secondly, he, want to, he wanted even the little women, he wanted women to understand, you know? So, he, and if you look at the book, I mean, it is so, uh, as you can associate with it, you can, you can peg on to it so intimately, like a leech, because it is so uh, demanding. And I'll tell you one final thing, Dante will not reach his glory unless you read the Divine Comedy. You, Shrikant, you, Michael, you, Philip, you, Judy, you, you Joseph, you, Isabel all of us, unless we read the, Dante is probably st- still circling, if ever, uh, the, the Purgatorio, you know, the pride, in the first circle, he's there for 700, 700 years, so you better hurry up and read, <laughs> read the comedy. <laughs> no, be- beautifully put, beautifully put, and it's uh, exactly like that for uh, all creative people. You know, Leonardo started so many things, and people keep saying, oh, you didn't finish it. You didn't. But the thing is that they start like thousands of things and they are, they are explorations. And then they find things that actually work really well. And they drop things very quickly and they go off, you know, after the things that are really high value. And uh, so, so uh, when was this, when did you finish your thesis? Many years ago, Many years. Uh, uh, in the 80s. <laughs> and what have you been and, doing with Dante since? Uh, well, the thing is that uh, I, I taught Italian mm-hmm. in a few universities here in Worcester. I, I was never a, a professor. I was a lecturer. So that's the, that's the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. Mm-hmm. And um, so there was really nothing that could really hold me on to any one particular place. But I ended up doing uh, on the community level since I was so excited about Dante. In fact, um, anyway, I, and I knew more. See, it's the problem when you write a thesis. You know more than your teacher. You know more because you, you live it. You, you're in it. You're every, every line you have to research. I have to research this. I have to research that. 
but um, so I taught, uh, the, I've gone down to Inferno, up to Paradiso, I would say about uh, 10 times mm -hmm. uh, with small groups, mostly community groups. And, um, but this is the first time I was telling Doug that I am doing the same thing now, a very small group of two people, but for the first time for me and uh, for the students that are taking it, I'm doing it in Italian and discussion in Italian. So it's really a wonderful way to rehearse your language in a context instead of, you know, the, the, the book is on the table, blah, 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 in a context. Anyway, that's when, how it when ended. You insisted that I should read Dante. Are you saying that I should, I have to read it in Italian for him? Uh, it, it, if you want to be like Luis Borges, okay. who, by the way, Borges uh, learned Italian through the Divine Comedy by going to his job and taking his little streetcar for 30 years and every day studying in, during his commute. He learned Italian through the Divine Comedy. No, the trans, you don't have to do that. If you want to, that's fine because it will go, it will give you, it will raise you to another level as it would if I knew German and read Goethe or German and read Heidegger. It will raise you to another level, but it's not necessary. I think uh, the translations are quite beautiful. Yeah, the, the thing is that if people like Dante or Victor Hugo or Goethe are people that, you know, you say, oh, I really should read, the, you know, learn this language. I mean, the, the, the power is such that it says, OK, I'm, I'm going to do some effort. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, let's see. Um, does anybody want to raise anything after this um, after this conversation? Imagine speaking in three lines, right? I mean, Italian, yes. Okay, um, let's talk about the ancestry question. Um, is there a difference between Southern Europe and Northern Europe and the way in which they look at their ancestors and the place their ancestors hold in their lives? Anybody? If you have any thoughts, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Otherwise, we'll go to the next one. Um, it's going to be Doug followed by Phil. Doug. You're talking about the difference between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, right? Yes. Yeah, when I directed uh, Titus Andronicus, which is about Rome fighting the Northern tribes, I read Agricola's uh, book about the German tribes. And they're really very different cultures and very different uh, it's been a long time since I've read that, but there were really striking differences. And I think those differences between Northern and Southern Europe continue to this day. Uh, and even Ibsen picks up on that and goes back to Roman times to write some of his historical plays. Uh, and he said he never really melted as a playwright until he went to Rome and drank so much he was found in the gutters of Rome, but it melted his Nordic spirit. Uh, and uh, and uh, the so there, there there are real differences. I think that one of the most striking is I learned for the German tribes would make a decision when they were sober, and then they would get really drunk. And if they had the same decision when they were drunk as when they were sober, it was sort of a left brain, right brain decision making process. Or they would drink and make a decision and then debate it when they were stone cold sober. So they had this sort of tradition. I, Agricola writes about that, the Roman writer on the German tribes. Interesting, thank you. Next up is Phil followed by Joe. Phil. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up um, one of my favorite writers, uh, Michael Bulgakov. Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, Master and Margaret. And uh, there, there's a point, if, if you know the, the book, where uh, after Margaret is invited to the ball with, with Satan and Boland, you know, the devil, he admires her and he says, how interestingly the card deck is stacked. And he looks at her and says, yeah, that's gotta be blood. And she says, you will be very surprised if I told you uh, that one of uh, French queens would end up in Moscow in 1920s. Uh, all that to say that apparently that tradition of ancestry and bloodlines 
is really a universe, seems like a universal concept. It, it would seem that way to me, although it probably developed earlier in, in the South because you had more uh, um, settlements in the South as opposed to the North. And in, in, in cities, the memory of people is longer as to who is in what family, like Florence, you know, has that long lines of families that we still remember, Medici's and, and people still remember who they are. So, but anyway. Thank you. Let's go for this tough question. Um, what is the relationship between accepting God's plan and free will? I don't know whether I'm stating it as well as I could, but what's the difference between kind of surrendering yourself, accepting God's will or God's plan and your own capacity of free will in Dante or, you know, and if you would like to comment about that. I'll, Go ahead. I'll read the three lines in Canto 21, which uh, when this question is sort of asked, um, and I forget who it is, if it's uh, Benedict or not, uh, he starts spinning like a wheel and the light shines through like a shaft. And so he says, my bliss flames only as that ray shines down as much of glory as i am given to see my flame gives back in glory of its own so the, the, the remark i made in a little group was this is like uh in the enlightenment when we're talking about reason being the high ideal as opposed to god in, in this not the, this collection uh you're only as free uh, for kant as you are bound to the reason which gives you the law. So it's only by shedding the passions and feelings and desires and body and going to the pure mind that you are chained to your freedom. That's your freedom. Everything else you do is as an animal bound by your feelings. There, your freedom is your binding. So seeing the light of reason, or in this case, seeing the light of, you know, that's how you well, predestined because it's fixed, but you have to perceive it by letting the light shine. Wonderful, thank you. Alison, followed by Doug. Alison. Um, <clears throat> I know in the earlier, one of the earlier readings, um, Beatrice kept saying that to Dante that we have free will, God gave you free will. So God's plan includes free will. So therefore it is our responsibility to make good choices because um, that's, we're under control of that. And that was part of God's design. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, I'm gonna put a name here, I uh, may have mentioned before, but I haven't really explored this correlation yet of Roberto Assagioli, who's an Italian psychoanalyst who kind of mixes Jung and Freud into his own Italian mix. And he's written a book called Act of Will. And I think the, the sort of will what we often think of of will is one part of our personality that has to have a certain purpose. But then he has this concept of the personality that as you become more connected to all the different aspects of yourself and subpersonalities and you know what Jung might call archetypes and that, then you begin to, to tap into a higher will. And I, I think Dante's sort of dealing with that. What 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 we think we're doing, but what we're maybe because in this section we just read, Dante keeps saying there's something each individual seems uniquely designed to do, that they're stamped with something that they're supposed to do based on the stars and how they've stamped on them. And that's a very Bucky-like idea. And I think it ties in really closely to Asagioli. So I don't know if Asagioli was influenced by Dante, but I want to explore that a little more and try to figure out. Thank you. Uh, last question is on Dante's attitude towards other faiths. What do you think is Dante's attitude towards other faiths? Sure. I mean, well, I mean, he kind of goes through that with anybody that has even created a schism from the church, right? He has them in hell. Uh, and he has them, um, you know, graphically in hell, just somebody like Muhammad or anybody that has used religion for their own, uh, for their own, um, uh, you know, for their own personal gain. 
That being said, I actually think it's a little bit more open than people may initially think. Um, even his like use of the planets uh, in Paradiso, I think he's a little bit more open to science than he is to uh, to necessarily being so dogmatic. And I think his dealings with the church and understandings of being exiled that he he definitely sees there's problems um with with uh um with anybody that believes differently with the church but at the same time I, it's hard it's really hard to say i don't think it's as bad as people may assume considering who he, you know how he depicts certain people in hell i don't, I, I think he's more open than we think thank you next up is david Yeah, um, I'm with Joe, and, and I think that in Canto 20, I think it is, uh, where it's revealed to Dante that you think you know the rules, but it's not that simple. It's much more complex. You never would have thought, look who's here in heaven. Look who's number five, you know, five, was it Solomon five? And, and, you know, he can't be here by definition. But that's just your cognition, your thinking. It's just too limited. Who's to say what Hindus are divine, you know? have seen the light of this revelation. So I think the door is open to our ignorance on this and that that's as good as we get. So the door is not shut, and, and, you know, here. He's not willing to say it's closed like that. Bill. Yeah, in our discussion group, we also talked about this and I'm wondering if what other people will think in the larger circle about this idea that when it comes to physical things and the, you know, the transcendence of the universe, some of these sort of like the makeup of the universe itself, the physical makeup, it's okay to appeal to limitations of our reason, limitations of human mind. But when it comes to justice and meeting out justice, you have to involve rationality almost to the point where the person you're convicting has to agree with you that the accuser is correct. Otherwise it becomes arbitrary. Now that's just a assertion I'm, I'm making. I'm curious if other people will agree or disagree with me. And we had some disagreements, which uh, I think Michael disagreed with me a little bit. And I, I took his points about the fact that even in that you're dealing with things that really are impossible to, to discern because you're dealing with motives and things that are invisible to us, as opposed to the justice system on earth where we, de we don't deal with motive as much, uh, or at least we, we deal with it insofar as we can perceive it from other evidence. But um, in, in the heavenly court of justice, everything is sort of, that you have this X-ray vision of everything. And therefore, I guess the standard is different. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that out and see maybe other people can comment or whatnot. All right. If anybody wants to comment, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. All right. While we are waiting, um, okay. Um, it doesn't look like. All right. So let, let's do one thing. Um, so we can close this meetup. And uh, David and Maxine, uh, I have emailed you your contact information, each of us. And I'm really, really excited about this, uh, you know, about you guys doing the music meetup. I think it's going to be music to my ears to, to, to hear. Uh, and feel free to do it in any way you want, uh, any format. If you want to play something, that's fine. We can play uh, little clips. You can play yourself. You can talk. You can do anything. We'll just the only thing is that we should do some breakout rooms in the middle so people get to talk about what, what you put on the table. Uh, apart from that, you know, the format is all yours. Uh, do you guys have any questions or are you all set? All set? All right. Wonderful. All right, folks. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Khan. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Doug. And thank you, Bye. Phil. Bye. Thanks, Phil. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, all.